Consciousness is the the super system, if you will. Consciousness is the is the big picture. So we start with consciousness, and that's the big picture. From there on, if we have just two assumptions, and one that consciousness, you know, is consciousness exists, um, and that evolution exists, and by evolution I mean a very generic kind of evolution, and that is that that uh, large complex systems that are self-changing will change for their own, you know, for their own benefit. That's kind of the idea of, of the evolution. So if you just have those two assumptions, all the rest you can derive. From there, you can derive not only our local consciousness, our awareness here, you can derive this physical reality. You not only can, can derive the, the nature and basic facts and physics of the physical reality, but you can derive the why of the physical reality. Why is it here? Why are we here? What's the point? Um, you, can, you can then go on to develop the physics from those two assumptions. Um, quantum mechanics, based on an assumption that matter at the, at the micro level is just probability distributions. And it turns out that matter at the macro level is just probability distributions as well. And they work the same way in the macro world as it works in the, in the micro world. Um, you can you can derive relativity. Relativity is based on one central fact, and that is that the speed of light is a constant. It doesn't matter how the the light is moving, the light itself, you know, it doesn't matter the velocity of the source, the light from that source always travels at the same speed. And it's a constant called C. And from that fact, special relativity falls out as just a little bit of algebra and then general relativity falls out of special relativity. So the, the, the key piece of knowledge there is that C is a constant. And of course, that's a big mystery, just like why should particles be probability distributions? Real big mystery. Well, if you understand this reality as virtual and as consciousness is the computer generating the virtual reality, then you can derive these things. The reason that C is a constant is in this virtual reality. Think of it as a simulation. Simulations are driven by the time loop. So you have a delta T. Every delta T, the simulation updates itself. In, in, uh, in this reality, that's a very small number. It's like 10 to the minus 43 seconds, or 44 seconds. So it's a very, you know, very fast turnaround. That's uh, like, um, oh, I don't know how we say that. That's like 30 some orders of magnitude smaller than what we can measure yet. So it's very small. So in any case, every delta T, you can move a piece of virtual information, if you will, from this spot to that spot. And the next delta T, you can move it to the next you know, adjacent spot. And that's as fast as, as, as uh, you know, it can be moved. Well, that, how fast is that? That's C, that's the speed of light. So the speed of light's a constant because this is a virtual reality and how the virtual reality works. So now we're deriving physics, you see. From these understandings, the rest of it is just working out the math once you understand these basic ideas. Now what, what physics has done is they started with working out the math but don't have a clue as to why it should be that way. Why should C be a constant? Why should particles be probability distributions? It's like, well, I don't know, it is, big mystery. Nobody will ever understand it, but we know if we make that assumption, we can compute right answers that, that um, experiment then verifies. Well, if you start, that's because they're starting in a subset. If you start with a subset of the knowledge, all you can do is calculate from there on. The why, you have to understand the superset. You see, that feeds the subset. So in the superset is consciousness. Consciousness is a digital information field. Then this is a simulation. This is a virtual reality. So you see, if we start with consciousness and understand that consciousness is a natural system, evolving, still evolving, it's still changing, we're a part of that evolution, then all the science, all the physics, and the chemistry and the biology then falls out as logical deductions, if you will, from those few basic things. And it, it also, you know, tying this conscious to physics, it also explains a lot of other mysteries as well. The paranormal then is just normal. It's only paranormal as seen from the subset. 
once you have your viewpoint from the superset, there's nothing para about it. It's just normal. It's just the way things work. Um, it's perfectly understandable, repeatable, uh, obvious. It follows logical rules, just like anything else. Uh, look at the, all the work that's been done at Pear Labs, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research. They have shown beyond any shadow of a doubt that mind affects matter. Mind changes future reality, and they don't know why. See, they're still working inside the subset. They only know that this happens. If you do these things, you get results, you get evidence, scientific evidence that mind affects matter. You have the placebo effect, mind affects matter. You have all these things that happen, that have been happening for centuries, that are mysteries. And the ones that we can't derive directly from physical process, you know, we uh, call those paranormal. Normal meaning it's, a, it's an objective physical process. So that's how the physics and the consciousness all kind of fit in together into, into one program. You can solve these mysteries that we've had. You know, what did the Buddha mean when he said that this physical reality was illusion? Well, if you understand from the larger picture, that's not just poetry, that's a fact. You know, it's just the way it is. Um, why is it that uh, the answer to any question that is really fundamental is love. Love is the answer. Why is love core to this? Well, if you do the physics from the big picture, you find out that love is a evolving, it's the state you get to as you evolve your, evolve your consciousness. So a, a highly evolved consciousness is love. And that's our point. We're evolving toward that. So then the metaphysics, the philosophy, the theology, the chemistry, the biology, all kind of fall out of this one overall understanding of the nature of reality as consciousness and then physical as virtual and there are multiple realities. This virtual reality is not the only reality frame, there are other reality frames and that's kind of the, the overview if you will between physics, consciousness and what we see here. <laughs> Well, first of all, Tom, I want to really thank you for, for being here today because I'm a biologist and I had to dabble in the physics and I, I, I'm a dabbler in that regard. But then when I hear what you say and what you talk about, then I realize that my dabbling wasn't too far off course. And for mm -hmm. me, it's very profound because as a biologist, uh, I, I, the amount of physics I took as a biologist was enough just to get out of physics so I could stay in biology. <laughs> so uh, basically, I, I like most all the biologists, trained in a Newtonian physics uh, and, and then left that physics behind as we went into biology and biology uh, premised on a Newtonian physics is a mechanical physical reality mechanism so that a cell is seen as a, uh, a composition of biochemicals and genes and uh, it, it just looked at as, as a machine so to speak. The, the interesting part about this is this is uh, what I was actually teaching when I was teaching in medical school, I was teaching this to students and coming down to a very simple understanding about the machine itself called fundamental uh, reductionist view that it was all driven by DNA. And so when I was teaching in medical school, we were teaching a concept called genetic determinism. This says that the genetic blueprints really determine your fate and your future and the character of your life. Uh, it's an unfortunate teaching for this very important reason because as far as we know, which I'll challenge at some point, uh, we didn't select the genes that we came with. And since genes control our lives, we also cannot change the genes that we came with. So we are um, being given an education that says we are victims. We are victims of our heredity and that uh, the genes control us and as victims we let go of our own self-empowerment, our own self-control and, and give that up to so-called professionals like the allopathic community takes care of my health, I can't do it. So that victimization is what I was teaching. At the same time I was fortunate enough, and this was 45 years ago, to be working on stem cells, cloning stem cells. Uh, and 45 years ago I can assure you there were just a handful of us in the entire world that had any idea what the heck stem cells were all about. Stem cells are just multi-potential cells. The moment before you're born, that cell is called an embryonic cell because it's a multi-potential cell. The moment you're born, can't call it an embryonic cell anymore, you're born, so now we change the name, call it a stem cell, same thing. 
what my research was uh, all about was simple, and yet the results were so profound that it changed the entire course and track of my life. And what the research revealed was this. I took one simple stem cell, put it in a tissue culture dish all by itself. It divides every 10, 12 hours. After over a week, I'd say maybe 50,000 cells are in the Petri dish. The significance is all these 50,000 cells are genetically identical because they came from the same parent. But the real experiment was then take those cells out of the Petri dish, split them up into three different Petri dishes, and change the environment in each Petri dish. Uh, the environment to a cell is a culture medium. Uh, cells are like fish. They live in an aquarium. And you have to provide the, all the elements they need for their life in that fluid of the aquarium. So I make a culture medium. What I did was I took these genetically identical cells, put them in three different Petri dishes with three different uh, media with different chemical composition. In one dish, the cells form muscle. In one dish, the cells form bone. And in the third dish, the cells form fat cells. The most profound question you can ask in this research is, what controls the fate of the cells? The answer is clearly it wasn't the genes because they were all genetically identical. The only thing that was different was the environment. So while I was teaching medical students genes control life, the cells were teaching me that they were responsive and complementary to an environment. And the significance about that was the belief that I was also teaching that genes control life led to the concept that the nucleus of the cell, which is the repository for almost all of the genes, represented the brain of the cell because that's where the DNA was and that's where the DNA controls life, and so the nucleus is the brain of the cell. Well, what my research started to reveal was a very simple fact that uh, that was not true at all. <laughs> the nucleus is the gonad of the cell. It's reproduction. It has blueprints. We gave DNA self-actualization. We talk about genes turning on and genes turning off, genes making decisions. When it turns out, they're simply blueprints. Genes are blueprints, and as blueprints, they have no self-actualization. A blueprint doesn't turn itself on or turn itself off. It's just a piece of coded information. What you really want to understand is who's the contractor, what's the contractor that reads the genes, selects the genes, so etc. My research took me out of the nucleus and brought me to the skin of the cell, the cell membrane, which is the first primary structure in the most primitive organisms on the planet. The, the basic structure they have is a cell membrane. The rest of it is a soupy cytoplasm. The cell membrane for years by biologists was considered nothing more than saran wrap with holes in it to let stuff in and let stuff out. And, a, and the significance is in biology, which is a materialistic uh, physical science, uh, they looked at the nature of the cell membrane, saw how that thin that was, you could only see it in the electron microscope and it just had a little three layers to it. And they said, ah, something that simple can't be that important. And so they dismissed it. My work took me to cell membrane, and on one evening, which was my, uh, an epiphany that changed my entire life, uh, uh, a download from the universe, uh, in my quest for understanding the nature of the cell membrane, I defined the membrane in a different way than I had done for 10 years. And on that particular night, I looked at the membrane and defined it as, uh, and this is the biochemical terminology, the membrane is a liquid crystal semiconductor with gates and channels. The gates are called receptors and the channels are called channels. And the significance about that was, at first I thought, wow, what a coincidence. The cell membrane and a computer chip share the exact same uh, uh, names, terminology. But as I started to say, wait a minute, let's check on it, I started to recognize that Comparing a cell membrane to a computer chip is not an analogy, it's something we call a homology, meaning its physical structure and its function of the cell membrane are the exact same thing as the physical structure and function of a computer chip. They are both exactly the same. Well, what was so profound for me at the time when I was recognizing this, I recognized, oh, the cell is a programmable chip. The nucleus is a disk with programs, the DNA genes, the hard programs. But the cell membrane was an access device to select the programs and engage the function of the system. So all of a sudden, when I started to look at the, the cell membrane as the cell, you know, uh, as the brain of the cell, it also then dawned on me because I was typing on my computer at the same moment and I realized the cell and the computer are the same thing, but the 
computer doesn't do anything unless I type on it. And all of a sudden I started to realize a cell has no behavior if it's disconnected from the environment. If you cut the what are called the receptors off the surface of the cell, it's comatose. It just sits there, it does nothing. Once the receptors are back onto the surface again, which the cell will replace, the cell then expresses behavior. Simple understanding. The behavior of a cell is a reflection of the environment. And that the environment was what was actually involved with the uh, cell membrane ultimately selecting the genes. And that the cells became a complement to the environment. Yet the most profound piece of it for me as a mechanical cellular biologist so focused on genes and chemistry and all that was as I was at this very same moment putting this together and starting to get this big aha, the biggest aha that hit me and blew me away was the fact that no two people have the same identity. The identity meaning this, if uh, Tom takes cells out of his body and puts it into mine, uh, my immune system will say not self and reject it. Vice versa, I put my cells into Tom's body, his immune system says not self. <coughs> and at this point I recognize, well look, cells have identity. And when the understanding of the cell membrane as a control came in, it also hit me that on the cell surfaces of each of our cells, we're virtually all of our cells, uh, there are a set of antennas, protein, uh, glycoprotein antennas, that read environmental information and actually a subset of these recognized by science are called self receptors receivers of self of course they weren't thinking of it in that terminology but what I started to recognize oh my god the self receptors distinguish one identity from another identity if I remove the self receptors from a cell the cell is generic and I can implant that generic cell into any human because it's now just a human cell with no personal identity to it if Theoretically, then, I take my cell, take off my cell surf recept self receptors, my cell becomes generic, but if I take one of Tom's cells and then take his self receptors off and transplant them onto my cell, if I take that cell, my cell, put it back in my body, reject it as not self. But I take my cell with his surface receptors and put it back into his body, it's accepted as self. The significance was you transfer ownership and identity by a set of antennas. Well, conventional scientists, of course, only look at these antennas as physical molecules and say, oh, yes, the physical chemistry of the receptor is responsible for the difference. It's like they missed the point. Receptors, by their definition, are receivers of information. That my cells pick up a different band of information than Tom cells pick up that my cells are picking up information from the environment. That's where the receptors are reading. And what hit me at that moment as being a strictly materialist, uh, uh, physical biology guy, at that very instant I realized, well, wait a minute, if my identity is being picked up from the environment, then if my cell is here or my cell's not here, that doesn't make any difference to the existence of my identity. It's still part of the environment. And all of a sudden I said, oh my God, <laughs> I'm not even in this thing. I am a signal being picked up and playing through this body. And, and this blew my mind because the first thing says, well, immortality is, uh, is, is a given. Why? It's the body that comes and goes, not the field information of my identity that's always there. And then I also realized that, oh my gosh, we can't go to Mars, but we really want to know what Mars is all about. So what do we do? We send up something called the, the rover. And the rover doesn't look like a human. It's a vehicle with wheels and all kinds of stuff like that. And it moves all over the surface. I say, yeah, but it's the equivalent of a human. Why? It takes the environment of, of Mars and converts it into what? Vision, smell, taste, sound, all of these things. Why? Because this is how we read the environment. So the rover has receptors to read the environment and pick up this information. But the important part about it is this. The rover is not an isolated mechanism on its own. It's being driven by somebody at NASA. And that sending a signal up and it's being received by an antenna. But it's not a one-way street because the rover, in traveling around Mars, picks up the information from Mars and sends it back through the same antenna to the source. So the guy at NASA has an experience of what being on Mars would be like. Well, they hit me. I said, oh, my God, we're Earth rovers. <laughs> <laughs> that we receive information, experience information, 
and, and, and then return it to the source. And it was interesting because the biggest aha of all that came from my own cells. I asked a question to the universe, which then my cells answered. I asked a question when I just realized and owned I exist as a field energy, a spirit, whatever you want to call it, as information in the field. And I also exist as a body. My first question that came up in my head was, then why have both? Why have a spirit and a body? Why not just be the spirit? And my cells came up with this chorus that I just blasted my head. And it was kind of funny because I, I think they, they have Jewish heritage cells because <laughs> I asked the, them a question and they responded in a question. I asked, why have both? And all of a sudden it welled up and the answer came and said, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? And all of a sudden I said, oh my God, it's the biology which is all the receptor devices that translate my environment into sensation which are then translated by the nervous system into fields and, and vibrational patterns which are then sent back to my source. And I realized at that moment, I said, my God, the, we're here to experience this place, to touch it and smell it, watch sunsets and feel love and, 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 and eat wonderful food and have all this. And I thought, wow. And then all of a sudden I said, yeah, but it's not just receiving information. When you have a body, you can be creative. We can come to this planet and manifest creativity. And we do this, we step into a virtual reality suit called the body. I step into the suit as a spirit, it communicates with me via just the same way the Mars rover is communicating with NASA, and I get to experience this planet. Beautiful part about it is, of course, I'm going off on all this stuff and say, well, what the heck is that source that you're, that's being read? Well, the first thing is this, it's not physical, it's an energy source. And with more information that quantum physicists have provided us about the biology of proteins, which are the antennas, it reveals that they respond to environmental information uh, through quantum entanglement, through constructive and destructive interference patterns, and all of a sudden it shifted me from my physical, mechanical world to try to understand this. Well, the part is, I'm not the physicist. My dabbling into the physics really came up with a support for all this, but then when I heard Tom say, yes, uh, we come into this life in this virtual reality, I go, Okay, we're, play we're talking the same thing. <laughs> uh, and what's so interesting about it is, exactly as Tom uh, talked about, I saw this as a great video game, that I jump into this character. And what's really interesting is because I mentioned earlier, I said, as far as we know, we didn't pick our genes. If you can go back upwards and say, what am I going to do when I jump into this character, is that I set up a script to run a show. And I set up a script by picking parents and picking my genes and picking all these things. It's sort of like when, when, when the video game started to get more complex, not only were you a character, before you play the game, you say, well, uh, it was like the, one of the military ones, is just say, well, before you jump in the game, uh, you can have a choice of four rockets, six hand grenades, three of these things and those things. So you pick these things before you jump into the game. And once you jump into the game with those, then you have to play the, the game with what you just selected. So what I saw was, oh my God, we come in with a vision to learn something, to create something, to manifest something. And in that process, then we selected the genes, we selected our family, we selected all the aspects of this because you jump into the game. But then the problem is, once we jump into the game, we forget that we're the player of the game, we become <coughs> the piece in the game. And then if you stay inside the piece, you lose the contact that you're far greater than, this, than, the, than the piece itself. And so the issue is being the piece, recognizing that we jumped in and we get programmed, and then we play out the program, leads to a very interesting and humorous insight. The movie The Matrix is not science fiction, it's a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> and it says that it's time for us to wake up that we have bought other people's truths and other people's beliefs and manifested a world rather than coming with our own beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that when we give up our power to buy other people's knowledge, then we bought their reality and we manifest their reality. And why this is so important is when I try to tell people in the new biology, 
you are creating this life. And most of them go, I wouldn't create this. You know, war, violence, all this kind of stuff. And I go, well, you're, you're creating it, but you let go of creative control because you bought into other people's beliefs about that control. But I said, here's, I bet you what, though? There was a time in your life where you probably fell in love. And when you fell in love, there was a period which I refer to as the honeymoon. A honeymoon is a period that in most people uh, is exemplified by being in exuberant health, having tremendous energy, you know, making love for days without stopping for food or sleep <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And, and that life was so beautiful in that honeymoon that you couldn't wait for the next day to have more experience like that in this honeymoon. And I said, well, was that tantamount to creating heaven on earth? And the answer is, yeah. Then I say, that was not an accident. That was not a coincidence. That was actually an understanding when you operated from your conscious wishes and desires and overwrote and overrode your subconscious programming. For the first time in your life, you actually empowered your life with your wishes and desires and created heaven on earth. Uh, that honeymoon generally comes to an end when you uh, get so ba busy that you let go of that and you will get back into the automatic programming of your life and that honeymoon seems to dissipate at that point. The fact was what? You created heaven on earth. All of us could do that every day of our lives. And so if we understood how we did it, we could, uh, and understand of course why we lost it, <laughs> there, there's then the understanding is that you could come back and then do this as a perpetual existence on this planet to live in a state of the honeymoon, to be healthy, happy, and be so creative that you can't wait for the next day to have more. You've already done it once, <laughs> and we can do it on and on. Uh, what we need is the information that Tom offers, because we have to say with more assurity, because uh, as Tom also brought this up, the civilization that we live in is based on what is called materialistic scientism. And it basically says that we buy our truths in this civilization from science because we recognize them as the truth provider. Is it scientific? Oh, well, that means it's true. Well, we bought our truths from these people. And the fact is, what we have to recognize is that conventional truths, which are based on a Newtonian world of a mechanism and physical reality, are not the reality that Tom is speaking about, that the quantum physicists even knew about in the 1920s when they talked about the whole thing was consciousness in the first place. When the public understands Tom's message, when the public can take Tom's message integrated with my message, then what they've already done is recognize, oh my God, I'm an Earth rover here to create, here to experience, and here to manifest the love which is I find from my biological pursuit and which Tom finds from his physics pursuit to still be the most fundamental element of both of these sciences. And when they come together and love manifests on this planet, we are already engaged in the next higher level of human evolution. Yes. So that's it. That is that's evolution. the end of the story. Okay, we're finished. <laughs> 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 but that, but, but so both of you have provided the viewer with an understanding that the next evolution is not going to be getting another finger or losing no. a finger. It's going to be a shift in organization, uh, which you would call well, it's information, it's entropy, it's lowering, lowering the entropy, entropy of the system. That's what it, information systems do. That's, uh, that's the criteria. You know, if you look at a physical system, and how it evolves, then it's the, it has to procreate, otherwise eventually it disappears, and you know, it has to survive or it can't procreate. So those are the criteria in our physical system for evolving. In an information system, in a consciousness, the larger conscious system, the way an information system evolves is by lowering its entropy. That means by, by increasing the amount of information better information, more useful information. In information theory, you have randomness. All your bits are random, no information. If you can arrange these bits in ways that mean something to you, then that's information. So informa entropy is a measure of, of disorder. High entropy, high disorder, more randomness. So here you have this, this uh, larger consciousness system, this digital information system, and it's evolving, and its criteria for that evolution is lowering entropy, okay? increasing the quality of that information. 
then you get to the point, and you'll have to get this from a much longer talk someplace, and I can't you know, do all that in a short time. You realize that the optimum, um, kind of the optimum low entropy configuration is called love. And that's because consciousness is not about one big monolithic consciousness. Just like biology is not about one big monolithic cell, it's about organizations of cells. That organization is lowering entropy. You can look at biological evolution actually the same way in terms of entropy. It evolves by becoming uh, better information, if you will. Better, more, it's not always more complex, but it often more complexity gives it more order, more structure, lower entropy. So here we are in this larger consciousness system, just a natural system. Uh, that is evolving toward lower entropy states. We are a collection of individuated units of consciousness interacting with each other because that's lower entropy. That's more complex. That's more order. That's more structure, you see. That's evolution. Now when you have a, it's become social. It's become an interactive thing, not just a big monolithic consciousness system, but a whole lot of individuated unit of, units of consciousness communicating with each other, all netted to each other. We are all netted to each other for the same reason. So when you have this community, the way you optimize the relationships of community is by becoming love. The opposite of that is by fear. Fear is the opposite of love. Fear is um, tears apart, drags it down, does not build. Fear is not a constructive thing. Fear is, a, is a something that pulls away. So look at, you know, we, we can look at this, this um, reality that we're in, okay? What would a social arrangement based on fear look like? Well, the individuals would not have any trust because it's based on fear. If somebody got something that was better, a new idea, they'd hold it for themselves so that they could use it to their own best advantage. It's all, what about me? Uh, if you had a large collection of such individuals, what would you expect? You would expect they'd all be struggling with each other, trying to get more stuff, get each other stuff, because that's the nature of fear. It's all about me, fear, protect me. What about mine? Am I going to get enough? What if somebody takes my stuff? Well, now you have to have defense. And if you have to have defense, eventually you have a lot of entities together. You'll have groups of entities forming defense arrangements, right? We call those nations. And these then will fight with each other to keep their stuff or get somebody else's stuff. And eventually in this group, you would have probably, you know, 5% of all the entities in it owning 95% of all of the value. And everybody else would be struggling to get by because that's just the way this works. As you form these defense things, they get power in their own and then there's control of that power. So look around us. What do we have? We obviously have a system that's primarily based on fear because what we've got is, is what fear produces. But now look at the other side. Let's say we have a bunch of people and it's all love-based. It's not about self and what about mine and keeping mine. It's about other. Well, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Oh, I invent something that's really useful. Here, let me share it. You uh, have time or you have labor or whatever your talents are, whether it's because you're big and strong or whether it's because you, you know, are good at weaving. You know, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, we share it. We get along. I'll do this for you. You do that for mine. I look at this group. What do they create in the long term? Well, they optimize. They optimize through the relationship of something that works for everybody. Nobody's trying to grab something to make sure somebody else doesn't get it before them or keep it away. Defense isn't an issue. There's trust, there's cooperation. So you see, that's how you can get to this idea that the optimal configuration of a group of sentient entities is love, that they inter interact with each other with love. So that's the low entropy solution. Okay, so if all of these, you know, that decreases the entropy of the system. It also decreases the entropy of the individual. So the entropy of the, of the individual consciousnesses is decreased, more order, more useful information. Uh, the entropy of the system, which is made up of the entropy, of course, of all the individuals, uh, decreases. So remember, we started this with saying that that is the criteria for evolution. So the system evolves. 
rather than de-evolves, and it only has two choices. Large complex systems can't really stay in that A-stable state of evolve a little, de-evolve a little. You can do that for a while, but eventually it comes to two choices. You either evolve or you die. In information systems, die means you end up with, you know, no information. You basically, it dissolves. It pulls itself apart. It uh, uh, loses its order and structure and meaning and, and significance. Okay, so then that gets us to the answer to why are we doing all this? Why are we here? Why would you need two things, the spirit and the, you know, and the, and the, uh, the physical, if you will? Well, this physical, of course, isn't physical. It's a virtual reality. Why? Because what we're here to do is experience. Just what Bruce said. This is our point. We're here in a virtual reality to experience. And what's the point of an experiencing? So we can grow up. So we can lower the entropy of our consciousness. We're part of this larger system strategy to evolve, to not die. Okay? And so we're here in this experiential space. All experiential realities are virtual realities. Our dream reality is another virtual reality. Where, what happens where you wake up after you die here is another virtual reality. If it's experiential reality, it's a virtual reality. And there are hundreds and hundreds of virtual realities, some of them physical, appearing like this one, because their rule set is tight. The rule set is the structure of how energy exchanges in that, in that set, you know, and that kind of defines how it works. So in this our rule set is basically what science digs up, you know, all the facts, you know, the gravity and, and uh, you know, the biology, the chemistry. These, are, these all become parts of the, of the facts, of the rule set of this virtual reality. Every virtual reality has to have a rule set. Otherwise, the beings in the virtual reality, you know, wouldn't know what to do or how to do it. There wouldn't be any structure to it, so it wouldn't be of any value. So you have these virtual realities where individuated units of consciousness go to have experience with a free will. Now free will is really a simple thing. It's not such a big thing. Free will is just the free will to choose from among your available choices. Available to you. Now that doesn't mean all the theoretical choices you might have, because you might have a hundred choices given a stimulus, but you may only be aware of ten of those. Well, you're, you have free will to choose one of those ten. That's all the free will you need in order to grow. Now, if you make a choice that is more toward being love, more toward cooperation, toward sharing, toward helping, to it's about you, not just about me, you make a love-based choice rather than a fear-based choice, then you and the whole system evolves. If you make a choice that's, hmm, what do you have that I want, and how am I going to get it, and if I get it, how am I going to keep it, if that's the way you interact, then that's a fear-based choice, and you de-evolve, and the whole system de-evolves. So here we are, part, you know, we're individuated pieces of this larger consciousness system. We're here in order to experience so that we can make choices, which basically means, uh, you know, it, it, the choices are really the, the things that we make in this virtual reality are really kind of secondary. The first thing is our intent. Our intent is what describes us, the quality of our being. I talk about the quality of consciousness. So that is who and what we are at the inside, at the gut level. You may say at the spiritual level or at the core level. And we have this intent, and this intent then is expressed in choice. My intent is that I'd like to be helpful to you. I'd like to do things that, you know, make your life better or easier or whatever. And my intent is, you know, this, or my intent is to see how much of what you have that I need that I can get. So these are our tents. Because of the intent, we take a choice of the choices that we see that are available to us. So free will can obviously be programmed in a computer, if you will, because all you need has some fuzzy logic, so it's not, it's not um, you know, uh, all you know, just logical process. It has to be some choice in it. And in this world, what, what happens? We never have enough in information to make a logical choice. You can't deduce anything except the most trivial of things. You know, where did I leave my glasses? Well, you can deduce a little of that. You can say, well, where was I last? Well, they're not there. Where was I before that? You know, and so on. You can use a little logic, but that's a very trivial problem. And all the big things that actually matter, who am I going to marry? Where am I going to live? How many children would I like to have? You don't have enough information to make a logical decision. 
very little of our life and very little of our intent and our choices are based on logic. Now we believe that we're logical. We believe that we're, ra that we're rational beings, but in fact, we're not. And we couldn't be, we don't have enough information. So we're in this situation of choice making. And you could, this is not incompatible with a digital simulation at all. You know, you just have, if you have a digital simulation where there's not enough information to make, you know, um, you know, a specific choice is the only one that's good, then you make these kind of fuzzy choices. Well, based on my experience, what's experience? That's all your input that you've take, that you've gotten. Based on all my input and based on the things I've done before and the way those have worked out, I think I'll go this way. You see, that's free will and not incompatible at all with a digital information system. So here we are, part of this larger system. We are in this virtual reality. Why? Because this gives us traction. In order to have in order to learn, you need choices. In order to have choices, you need a rule set to define the, the rules of the game. In order to have that, you need a virtual reality. Otherwise, you're just a consciousness interacting with a consciousness. Imagine 100,000 people all online in a chat room where there are no rules. You know? What can you learn? What do you get out of that? You know, how can, what information can you take away from that that's useful to you? Well, none, really. That, that big lumberjack you were talking with about, you know, life in the woods in Oregon, maybe a 13-year-old girl, you know, uh, sitting in her, you know, her father's apartment somewhere in a townhouse in, you know, New York City. You know, you have no idea about this information or the quality of it or where it, where it comes from. And it's hard to get traction in that kind of a situation where there's very, you know, the only rule is that you can receive and transmit. Here in this virtual reality, we have traction. We have feedback. We have you, you are a miserable person that's all about fear. You create a miserable environment that's all about fear. You know, that's feedback. You know, you're supposed to learn. So what are we here for? We're here to grow up. We're here to increase the quality of our consciousness. Why? Because we're part of a larger consciousness system and it's live or die. You know, that's just kind of the way it is. So that puts a context then to your, you know, you kind of question why, you know, why is it like this? And what are we doing here? Why do you have these various parts? But as Bruce was saying, it all boils down to information. See, that's what virtual realities are. They're just an information system. When you talk about the world of Warcraft, uh, you know, all the information is in the server. These are just, it's just on your screen is where the virtual reality is working. Well, our screen's a 3D screen in this virtual reality. Um, you know, let's talk a little about biology then. Uh, you know, what about our brain? You know, and people see, well, our brain is somehow the transducer between this other field and it, and I would not say it's energy. I don't, it's information. You know, energy is a metaphor, a metaphor for something that can affect something else. You know, we call that energy. Well, we're just information. We're getting information because that's what defines us and that's what, that's what defines the reality. So what about the brain? Does the brain um, contain a lot of information? No, the brain is a virtual brain. This is a virtual body. The brain doesn't compute anything. It doesn't process anything. It doesn't store anything. Well then, what's going on here? The only reason you think it does is because you believe this virtual reality is a real physical reality. That's why you think that brain is storing information. The reason we have the, these physical forms that we have and all the fauna and all the critters that we have here is because they have evolved here. They've evolved here in a big simulation that had a rule set that started with just a little ball of energy all in a tight wad at one place. Those were the initial conditions of this simulation, the rule set and the start with the ball of energy. Somebody hits the run button and the computer starts to compute and the little ball expands because it's very hot and we have a big digital bang, you see. And pretty soon we've evolved this universe and then part of this universe happens to be this little place called Earth that happens to have a sun that just happens to be about right for a couple of uh, amino acids to get together and have a dance and turn into a cell that evolves. And here we are sitting here today, you know, uh, at the result of all of that, of that evolution. Now, so what's this physical brain, you know, is just part of that simulation. It's just information. What it does is it defines the constraints. So we are consciousness. We are not physical bodies. We are not, you know, we are uh, 
<clears throat> you know, we, we live forever, right? We're, what's the word for that? We're immortal because we're not this physical stuff. But we're constrained by the rule set. The rule set as defined by this simulation. So we can only jump so high. We can't jump 20 feet in the air. Why? Because in this simulation that evolved the way it did, critters called us, can't jump 20 feet in the air. That's not the way they're built. They don't have the muscles, the, you know, the structure and so on to do that. We can't learn calculus and differential equations in, a, in an hour because our, the rule set says we have limitations on how we, how we can you know, process, how we can function. That's because of the biology. That's the evolution, the biology system. It's all part of this simulation, if you will. So what the brain does, it's, a, it's our representation of the constraints that's placed on our experience as subsets of this digital information system. So you see all the physical stuff are just constraints. Well, constraints work here just like they work in World of Warcraft. A guy in a World of Warcraft can't walk through a tree, can't walk through a rock. If it falls off a cliff, it gets hurt. If it stays too long underwater, it drowns. Those are all constraints that the, con the computer puts on the game. That's called that game's rule set. Well, we have a rule set. So this is solid. Why? Because that's in the rule set, just like, you know, the World of Warcraft guys find rocks and trees solid for the same reason. That's our physics. No two things can occupy the same place at the same time. Oh, well, I got one of the rules there. You so, so we can't do that. So that's, that's the idea. So that kind of ties it into biology. These biological systems we have basically represent the constraints that have evolved in this digital simulation and we as experiencers have to experience within the bounds of those constraints. So we can only remember so much, we can only process so much, we can only do so many things at the same time because that's the constraint. The evolution in this, this uh, simulation puts upon us. So that kind of ties then the, the biology, you know, and the, the, the information system together. The biology is just, is just a virtual biology but it sets the constraints on what we do. So that's, the, that's kind of the tie-in between the things that you were yeah. saying and kind of where I was. And that, that it's hard for people to get their arms around this idea we live in a virtual reality. It's, we have this cultural belief that this is physical, hard stuff. It's fundamental. This universe is it. There isn't anything outside this, this universe. Oh, there isn't? Well, what's this universe expanding into? Hmm, it doesn't make sense if there's just this universe and this universe is the root of all things that exist. What's it expanding? Well, it's not expanding anything. It's just a number in the simulation. It can expand, you know, you can take your computer and have a sphere and you can make that sphere get as big as you want. It's not limited by the size of the universe. You know, it can just expand. Um, big Bang? Where did that Big Bang come from? Where did that little ball of energy come from? Why was that sitting there and then suddenly let loose to expand? Where did that come from? Well, it couldn't come from this universe because our universe didn't exist yet. It didn't exist until that thing was there and expanded. So it had to come from elsewhere. Well, if we define physical as this universe, that's physical. It's our perception in this universe. Then what we're expanding into and where that, that ball of energy came from then has to be non-physical because it's not part of this universe, right? So right away, it's obvious that we're in a subset and that there is a superset out there that we call non-physical. That's, you know, this logic doesn't leave you any other, you know, any other uh, uh, explanation. And then once you understand that that, that uh, superset is just digital information, and science is coming to that conclusion all the time. You know, that's the same conclusion you came to with, it's just about information. These things are trading information. Information's at the core of everything. In quantum mechanics, they'll tell you that the very root core of the world is just information based on probability. So this larger system we're talking about is a probabilistic statistical system. It's not a deterministic system. You don't have to have a piece of data for every thing here, for every particle, for every state of every particle does not have to have a piece of data. That would be wasteful. We have to think of the system as being clever enough to have evolved to be efficient. It's a probabilistic reality. Why should particles be probability? The probabilist, you know, that's the root. 
It's a probabilistic reality. It's non-physical. And they come into our awareness in a data stream, just like it does in World of Warcraft. Your character's getting a data stream that comes to your computer that puts out the image. Well, here's our computer screen. This is 3D reality. It puts out this, this image. We interact. It's a multiplayer game. So see how all that just kind of works out real well. You yeah. see, we end up with the exact same conclusions, and uh, basically our difference is that we have different metaphors. Yeah. When you were talking about data sets of information, it's limited to this information. What I realized very early on in the game was when I started to recognize that the cell membrane was the brain of the cell. It took me into a whole other world of geometry and physics, and basically what it got into was that the cell membrane is the essentially equivalent of a two-dimensional structure. It's got a fixed uh, thickness to it. And what I started to recognize is that information was uh, represented by proteins in the cell membrane and actually uh, the proteins in the cell membrane that, that work together are two different proteins which are stimulus response. The receptor protein which receives a signal and an effector protein that translates a signal into a biological response. So I said, oh, well, by definition, and these are called integral membrane proteins. It's always fun. I tell the people in a lecture, I said, well, scientifically, this is called a receptor effector integral membrane protein complex. And everybody goes, <laughs> right? I go, well, let me, let me try and give it to you in a sense that is more personal for the lay audience especially. Rather than giving those scientific names, just define it. The receptor represents an awareness of the environment. That's what receptors do. Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. Uh, uh, the, the significance uh, is about the effector is that that's the protein that sends the signal as a physical sensation into the cell to manifest the response. Okay? Well, then I say, okay, so the definition of the receptor and effector is an awareness of the environment, receptor, through a physical sensation, effector. And when I put that down, I said, oh, my God, I looked in a dictionary, and sure is right there, perception, an awareness of the elements of the environment through physical sensation. So I thought, okay, instead of all that receptor, effector, stuff like that, these switches are units of perception. Mm -hmm. Each one is a precise, defined ability to take a signal and translate it into a response, okay? Well, here's the beautiful part. The thickness of the cell membrane and the dimensions of these receptor units, it, you cannot stack them on top of each other because the membrane and the protein almost have the same dimension. If you want to have more receptor units, then by definition, you have to increase surface area because you can't increase thickness, more proteins, uh, you have to have uh, more surface to stick them in. I give the analogy of a, a bread and butter sandwich as a, as a membrane and olives as the proteins. I say the thickness of the sandwich and the thickness of the olives are pretty close to the same. I, I can't put two olives on top of each other. So if I have a small piece of bread, a piece of cocktail, right, and I can get five olives on it, I say, okay, this piece of bread has an awareness of five perception units. I say, well, I want to make more perception. I say, well, first thing is you need a bigger piece of bread. So you get a big piece of sourdough bread, now you put 50 olives on it. And what do you do? You've increased the perception ability by increasing the surface area. Well, this opens up the door to the most amazing things. Number one, if you want to model putting two-dimensional surfaces in three-dimensional space, it's a requirement to use fractal geometry, number one. That's the, that is the geometry that, that is interdimensional geometry that will take surface area, make three-dimensional space. The immediate knowledge of putting fractal geometry in is that uh, the inherent nature of fractal geometry is as above, so below, because of the reiteration or iteration of, of self-similar structure all the way up, which means then if you understand nature, nature is fractal. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's one of the, the beautiful things about fractal geometry. You can use it, you can put an equation in to the computer and pull out plants and animals out of the equation. You can't do that with the conventional geometry you learn. So uh, basically it's already been recognized as yes, nature is fractal significance. If you can understand the pattern, then you can project a future <laughs> because that's a self-similar thing going on. Well, the first thing is this. What's awareness? Perception. Okay, what's more awareness? More perception. How do you make more perception? Increase surface area. Okay, 
the first organisms, bacteria, had a cell membrane of a defined size. They couldn't get any bigger because they were like invertebrates. They had a skeleton on the outside, kept the membrane, couldn't get the membrane to expand beyond the size of that. So by definition, bacteria as a life, first life form had perception, response to the world, adjusts its biology in response to perception, creates its life. But you can only maximize how many olives you can get in that membrane. <laughs> And the significance is bacteria reached a finite size with a finite amount of awareness. And there you go, <gasps> end of evolution. Can't put any more membrane molecules in there, that's the end. And they say, ah, no, paradigm shift. Take two bacteria and put them together. Let them share their membrane. And all of a sudden you say, oh, well then two bacteria are smarter than one bacteria. And the answer is yes. So what do bacteria do? Form community. And then the community organizes itself into individual organisms as community so we call that an amoeba and you say an amoeba it's a cell i go yeah but it's an evolution of a community of bacteria under the same skin so i say well then what happened well the amoeba has thousands of times more surface area than any of the bacteria do so what happens is the expansion of surface area became greater with the amoeba and it's not a, a, like an invertebrate cell. Its skeleton is on the inside, not on the outside, which means that it can get bigger and bigger. But it reaches a finite size for a reason. Uh, uh, consider a, a cell like a water balloon. You can take a balloon, you can put so much water into it, but there's a point where if you put too much water inside, the membrane of the balloon can't hold it and ruptures. If you rupture the membrane, you break the computer chip. What does it mean? Even amoebas reach a certain size that said, this is a standard size, there's a range, but it's a standard size of a cell. If it gets too much bigger, it's unwieldy and fragile and can break. So just like previously, the bacteria came to a certain size, that's all they could do. They came into a community, created amoeba. The amoeba, now the advanced community, thousands of times more surface area, it reaches a finite size. So evolution stopped again. <laughs> it couldn't make a, a bigger amoeba. But the pattern iterated itself. Amoebas say, what if I plugged into you? So uh, uh, amoebas are like computer chips, but when you start plugging them together, you build a computer out of them. And then you end up with like 50 trillion amoebas create a human being. And the human, brain, human being, uh, the surface area of the brain, now is uh, of, of the cell had surface area of brain. Uh, in the human, that surface area, which is derived from the skin, the brain is, and nervous systems derived from the skin, the surface, but incorporate it inside. And then if you look at vertebrate evolution, it starts out as a, a little round brain with so much surface area. And as evolution went and got, the brain got bigger, but what did it also do? Start to convolute the surface by, you know, these gyri, okay? And why is that relevant? Because the surface area got bigger and bigger and bigger. If you take the surface of the human brain and spread it out flat, it's far greater than the surface area of lower organisms, not as great as some organisms. Uh, such as cetaceans have, I think, more surface area than we do. But it's a surface area measurement, more surface area. Oh, so the human brain, uh, the brain evolved to the level of humans getting to a certain size, fitting inside his head, and guess what? Reached its uh, finite size. Then what? Oh, humans were the next amoeba. <laughs> Got to the highest level it could be. And then I say, yeah, but it's fractal. It's iterated the pattern. What did it do? The next level is humans join up as cells joining a superorganism, sharing their membrane surface area, and as a result, expanding on the awareness again. Uh, it's very interesting. Going back in human civilization's history, anthropologists have found that if you go back 400,000 years in human history and you look at all the archaeological digs, that for 350,000 years, it was exactly the same. You dig up something, they had the same tools, they ate the same things, they did the same things. 350,000 years, no human advance. 30,000 years ago, all of a sudden, there was a profound change. And human, uh, made, we made so much progress evolutionarily that today, uh, if you were measuring it on the curve, it, it, it started out as flat, and all of a sudden, it went, and now it's going up almost vertical at this moment. And the significance about that is scientists, being physical scientists, said, well, got more smarts 30,000 years ago. Must have been some new genes. We got new genes. And some say, no, no, it, the brain structure changed. So geneticists, neuroanatomists, went back to compare what happened 30,000 years ago, and guess what? Nothing. And it turns out, had nothing to do 
with the advancement of the individual human had everything to do with the advancement of the human community. That up to a certain size uh, time, communities were too small. As Tom said, if one person has an idea in that community, that's really great, but if the community is too small, you can't develop or use that idea. There's not enough other people to expand on it. So if you get an example like a computer, how many ideas did it take to develop to get to the computer? computer? It's about 50,000. You'd have to have 50,000 people just to put a computer together, each with a different idea to make it work. Well, before 30,000 years ago, obviously populations were not large enough to do that. So the significance is evolution is fractal, repetitive pattern of creating surface area for awareness, reaching a maximum size under the conditions of the physical conditions, then jumping to another level of organization, maximizing its surface area, and upon doing that, then jumping to the next level of organization. And so I say, where are we? We are at the verge of recognizing that each human is a cell in the same organism to share the information of <coughs> the billions of people on this planet. Just as if I went back and asked an amoeba, well, what do you think about space travel and computers and television sets? And the amoeba's like, <coughs> it, it couldn't even be, con there's nothing you could have conceived of as amoeba. But you put 50 trillion amoebas together and, uh, and we have space exploration. Why? The manifestation of higher and higher levels of awareness. The drive in evolution is expanding that surface area. And the drive that we're at right now, and as Tom is emphasizing this, is information. More and more information, as much as we can get, which is then, uh, you know, the, the whole concept of uh, taking the randomness out of things and putting the order into it, more and more order, more and more order, more and more order. And we are at a level now of recognizing we are at a very precarious situation. And the situ situation is this, if we gather more awareness and then come together in unity as humanity, we can survive and thrive. And with all that awareness, uh, uh, it, it, it actually it is called, something called emergence. The, the concept of, of new things that arise out of the numbers coming together that you could never have seen in the individuals that were putting it together. So, so does that mean that the population crisis is may, not necessarily a crisis? No, it's not a crisis at all. As a matter of fact, it, the crisis is uh, our lack of awareness. Not No, no, let me correct that. We have the awareness. It's the lack of the distribution of that awareness to the masses that's the problem. Uh, the significance is very clear is that, look, you got under your skin 50 trillion sentient beings. Every cell is the equivalent of a miniature human, has all of our functions fractal. Every function you show me in a human being, I'll show it to you in a single cell. It's already there. We can't do it. If a cell can't do it, we're made out of cells. <laughs> so the whole idea is that this fractal imagery is really telling us that the level is this. We have to come together with the awareness, the, the, the kind of bringing out of this new awareness that brings holism in, that brings love, as Tom talks about, as the fundamental drive to bring us together into that love of one humanity comprised of seven billion cells uh, is the necessity, the necessity of the information we need now. But we're operating from outdated, flawed scientific principles and created a culture. And, uh, and Tom talked about this, the culture of what? Fear. I said, where the hell do you get the fear from? Oh, Darwinian theory. <laughs> Darwinian theory said what? The, you're in a struggle for survival with a competition for fitness, and if you don't go out there and compete every day, you're going to be beaten into the ground and you're going to die. So everybody wakes up every day to get out there and fight in this world of I want for me, just as Tom said exactly the same thing. It's for me. It's for me. It's not for you. I need for my survival. You live in that fear. You generate the world we have now, competition, which is Darwinian. And then I say, the garden concept, garden is not competition. Garden, by definition, reflects total cooperation. The significance is our belief system bought as a truth because we bought it from our providers of truth, scientific materialism, have given us these actually four fundamental truths shape the culture, and these four fundamental truths that we bought and create a life from are totally flawed. Number one is what Tom talks about. We buy in biology a belief of a Newtonian world, and it's physical and it's chemical and all that. You leave out the invisible, the field, which I always love this because under my lecture I say, what's the definition of the field? 
invisible moving forces that shape the physical world. And I go, huh, interesting. The word spirit, invisible moving forces that shape the physical world. It's like, ah, oh, finally coming to the harmony here, right? Not in our conventional world. Our conventional world doesn't bring that in at all. It focuses on Newtonian, separates the invisible is not relevant when in fact, as quantum physicists will tell you, it's the invisible that shapes everything else anyway, so it's primary. That's flawed. Two, the belief that we're genetic automatons. Oh, we're victims. Genes control who we are. Which turns out this is absolutely untrue. It's our consciousness that determines who we are. Our consciousness mm -hmm. writes our genes. Our consciousness, through changing consciousness, let's think of this. Every gene blueprint in your body, which creates a protein, blue, a blueprint, depending on your consciousness, every blueprint you can create 30, 000, up to 30,000 variations on, uh, of proteins from the same gene blueprint just by the way you respond to the world. There's no limitation. It's only limitation of consciousness, okay? The third failure is that they're both, the third and fourth are both Darwinian. The third one, which we just mentioned, is Darwinian belief that uh, life is a struggle for existence with a competition for fitness. It's like, nature doesn't give a damn about the fittest human being. I mean, if we had to go to court for nature because nature said, look, you're destroying my, my garden. And we go in there with a Darwinian law practicing agent <laughs> who says, yeah, but uh, look, um, I know they've been destroying all this, but they had Einstein, and they had Beethoven, <laughs> and, and, and the judge would look at you and say, who gives a damn for the individuals? It's the mass of you that are destroying the planet. Nature doesn't care about the individuals. It says, what is the group doing? That this moment, with the lack of awareness and the misdirection of a world based on struggle and competition, we are destroying the planet as a group, and that's why nature is giving us an option to either shape up or be taken off this planet. And, and is that option in play right now? Absolutely it is right now. It's given fact of science. We're already deep into the sixth mass extinction of life. Five times on this planet, life got essentially wiped out and started over again. And the five previous versions of mass extinctions attributed things like comets hitting the planet, geological upheavals, you know, wiping out life. Uh, and then scientists are saying, oh, no, look, we're losing species of organisms faster than in previous mass extinctions. But the source is human behavior. So all of a sudden it says, wait, <laughs> we're committing suicide <laughs> with our belief system. And, and this is a time to wake up because now, just even a couple of weeks ago, the journal Nature said, we are at the tipping point. If we do not make a different response soon, then this thing is, uh, is going to accelerate downhill to a very rapid uh, conclusion. But, but, the, but the history that you've been talking about of the fractal history of the cell yeah. suggests that we will make the shift. It says we can make the shift. It didn't say we will make the shift. I can't say that. I have no idea. We are coming to the, to the point, the crossroads, where we either decide collectively to make the shift or, as most people would you know, tend to do right now, is just ignore everything gone and business as usual, go straight on to it. And the fact is, business as usual is resulting in the extinction. So uh, that's the, you know, we're not the first civilization to come to a level of, uh, of, uh, of awareness. And it's very important because I just talked about the three misperceptions, the, uh, the physics misperception, the genetics misperception, the competition misperception, and the, third, the fourth one uh, is very critical at this moment, and that is this. Uh, through our science, which is our current uh, truth provider for this civilization, and in fact from the previous civilization, religion, both of those truth providers suggested that, that uh, we were separate from the environment. Mm -hmm. Religion said, oh yeah, we create the environment and we stick some humans on at the top. Biology says something very similar in a different way. It says evolution is initiated by random mutations, meaning accidents. So that why are you here? Oh, a bunch of accidental random mutations. We were here for no purpose at all. When it turns out, that belief system is what's causing the problem. It says, oh, we're just on the top, we can do whatever we want. It's like, no, you, you missed the point. Every organism that was introduced into the environment was introduced by nature with an intent and purpose of, as Tom was talking about, 
creating harmony and connectivity and balance in the system. And every organism that was introduced has more power over that harmony and balance than the previous ones. So bacteria influence the environment, yeah, but humans influence at a much more higher powerful level. And if we didn't recognize what was our purpose to bring harmony and balance to the environment, but we are endowed with a power that can alter that environment, then we end up in the world that we're doing today. Without knowledge that we were here to bring harmony to it, we have ended up actually bringing the disharmony that Tom talks about is the falling apart. And, and so this is the point. The point is, do we own what the indigenous people already knew 10,000 years ago? We were here to tend a garden. And yet we've pillaged that garden to the extent that now we've, you know, so broken this fabric up that its survival is questionable for us, not for the planet. So a garden well tended by people capable of tending it is going toward something. It's going toward exactly what Tom yeah. talked about. A lower entropy system. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of ways that, um, you know, the things that Bruce was saying that fall right out of the, you know, the construct that, that I have too. Uh, in my books, I refer to reality as a process fractal. It's a consciousness evolution process fractal. You know, we have geometric fractals. Geometric fractals means you have a little geometric a little equation that gives you a, usually a two-dimensional line, a triangle. And you put a triangle and a triangle and a triangle, and the triangles get bigger and they get smaller, and it, it, that's a geometric fractal. And that's really the only kind of fractals that we think about. But there's another whole kind of fractals, another whole branch of mathematics that, that hasn't been invented yet that is process fractal. You have a simple process. This process is evolution. Evolution is a process that changes based on the environment and the needs of the system to grow, to become. And of course, we know that it's successful if it's becoming love. You know, so we have this process, and the process is this, you know, you do things, does that work? Does that help? You know, or not. If it helps, then you do this. If it doesn't, you go there, and it's just a little process. And this little evolutionary process then uh, is the fractal. It's a process fractal. So we work this process over and over again. So we have things that evolve to a certain point, and then from that point, things evolve in the same little process. You know, a little evolutionary process works from there and then works from there. So we have a, a and the thing that's evolving is consciousness. So all of reality is a consciousness hyphen evolution process fractal. That's what makes it all. Now, we look here and we see, well, why wouldn't the trees, the mountains, and the critters, you know, be, you know, be fractal? Why would this, you know, why does fractal geometry work here? Well, that's simple. If you have a process fractal going on in the bigger system, you reduce that down to a virtual reality that is just 3D. Now you've reduced it down to a, a 3D set. And guess what? If you let these 3D shapes or 2D shapes even to make it from, a, from like your, your, your uh, slice through it, triangles, whatever other way, simple shapes, right? You can build all this stuff up and here it is. That kind of tells you that, that the root of all this is information, right? I mean, that's the way information works. So yes, we have this, this consciousness evolution fractal that then produces a virtual reality and this virtual reality is fractal in its nature. And look at the, look at the difference between the cells in our body and us, as you say, the cells in, say, a culture. You know, say a living, a living culture is a, is a thing and it's got all these individual cells in it, which are people. Well, look at our body. You have all these different groups of cells, you know, the heart, the liver, the lungs, the skin, you know, the brain, all these things. And what are they doing? How are they interacting? It's a successful thing. Look how successful Very, this biology exactly. is. Exactly. How are they interacting? Fear or love? Cooperative or destructive? Well, if it gets destructive, we call that disease, self-destructive. That's autoimmune, autoimmune auto disease. Yeah. It's tearing itself apart. It's cancer. It's coming apart, you see? So we call that disease. As long as the communities are working together, now in our, because we are sentient, you know, and we're exchanging data and the way at the level we do, you know, we call that love. Well, at that level, it's basically cooperation, helping. Those cells, it's not necessarily about them, it's about how they play in the larger system. That's what they do. They do 
they take this enzyme and they pass it here, they take this uh, adrenaline and produce it here and move it there because that's what the system needs to get by. It's not because this little cell says, well, that's what I do and I'm going to make this adrenaline whether you want it or not because this is my thing and the hell with the rest of you. I mean, the body doesn't work that way. Their, their concept of love is cooperation, working together. Again, it's about other. So you see, here's a community, if you will, that is evolving, lowering its entropy, and it's the same process, you know, consciousness evolution process. That's an evolving process. Well, here we are in community, call it culture, call it the world, call it the universe, and here we are evolving, and we are trying to learn this lesson of love, of cooperation, of it's about other, not about us, so that we form something healthy and not disease, right? We can look at, you know, the metaphors work really well, you know, however you, uh, you want to look at it. Now let's say there are other, other Earths-like things in this universe. Well, is each one of them like a cell in a bigger intergalactic exactly. organism? That would and be the they, next level. Do they fact. have to learn to work together and to cooperate and whatever? Or is it going to be, oh, it's all about me, yeah. you know, and to hell with you. And you see, it's a, so it's, it's attitude. So what's at the root of all of this? Is that attitude? Well, what's attitude? It's your intent. It's basically consciousness, you see, is driving the whole thing. This is about the evolution of consciousness. And it's expressed in our biology. It's expressed out here in the trees and the, and the animals and the insects. It's expressed in every time we interact with another human being. We are expressing this fundamental drive, if you will, of consciousness to evolve rather than de-evolve. De-evolve means die, go away. Disease, it doesn't work. It's simple. Love is the answer, right? Give me a question that's a fundamental, important question, and love is the answer. Yeah, so it happens everywhere. And it is fractal at this 3D level because it's fractal at the, at the larger level. But the fractal isn't a geometric fractal. It's a process fractal. And the process is evolution. And evolution means things come together. What do they do? What's their intent? Is it cooperative? Is it love-based? Or is it fear-based that everyone's for themselves? If it's fear-based, what happens? It doesn't work, right? The organism, we wouldn't be here yeah. if all ourselves were yeah. out for themselves, if it was fear-based. Well, it's cooperative. That's why we build up this system that works. It's the same for that tree, you know? It's the same for everything. So it's, a, it's really a simple idea. And once you get the bigger picture, that this is an information system because when we get down to the bottom level, we see everything's information. At the very root, you know, down at the, the subatomic level, it's all just information. It's all probabilistic. How can that be? The solid world is just probability and information. Well, virtual reality, you see. And this is not the virtual reality. This is just a virtual reality. There are other virtual realities. And it's such a simple, overarching concept of consciousness, awareness, intent, is what's fundamental. That's the only thing that's fundamental. Everything else is virtual. And what is its purpose? Not to die, to evolve, to grow. And how does it do that? Cooperation, love, coming together. What tears it apart? Fear. I mean, how can you not see that, you know, in everything that happens, and kind of everywhere you go, see it in your own life, you know, like I say, you can see it in the body, yeah. You can see it in basically everything you look at. How is that? You know, it's almost like, how can you miss that? That that's what's fundamental. That's what's going on everywhere. And we're no different. We're just a part of this bigger thing, this larger consciousness system. We're just one tiny little speck. This whole universe, this whole virtual reality we call our universe, is just one little speck, you see? There's lots of other specks. And how can you, how can you go there? Well, you go there with your mind, your consciousness. Because your consciousness, your conscious, you have this intent. What's that called? Well, sometimes they call it out of body. Sometimes they call it, you know, remote viewing. Sometimes they call it all sorts of things. But these databases are there. Old, uh, uh, I guess it's Hindu uh, um, view of the world. That's the Akashic records. But it's just databases. The, this is a digital system. It works with data and information. Data is kept. Uh, History is important. Probable future is important. All this stuff works together. So yes, and, and then you take the next steps. Okay, in consciousness, then I can get all these different reality frames. I can find different virtual realities, 
dream reality is one of them. You can do these sorts of things. But then eventually you run out again to another level where you're consciousness and you can't step outside of consciousness. You're locked into that system just like your cell, you know, is locked into its system. Your bacteria in your gut are locked into that system. We can't get outside of consciousness. We can get outside of this virtual reality. Now, a lot of people would deny that, but you can with your mind, you see. We can affect this virtual reality with our intent. That's the placebo effect. It's you know, the, the cellular effect, you know. We are non-physical beings hallucinating bodies, basically. So it's just, I don't know, it's, uh, you know, here's Bruce, a biologist, came up through his own thing. You know, here I am, a physicist, going up a totally different direction. But guess what? We see the same world. On the, you know, when we look at it, it's the same, it's, we come to the same conclusions. And we're not the first two and the only two to no, do that. No. You know, for the last 6,000 years, almost back as far as written records are there, people have been understanding this. But what's different now is that it's being put into a logical context. If you read uh, the Tao Te Ching, if you, you know, read, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, you can find all the same ideas there but it's poetry, it has to be interpreted. It's not literal, it's not <laughs> science, it's not objective. Yeah. It does, you know, so you, you blow all that off. But here now, we're beginning to build science out of this. We're making it objective in the sense that it's logic. Here's these two assumptions. Here's, you know, here's evolution and how it's gonna work yeah. on those assumptions. Here's what you get, here's what works. Look at the data, you know, look at the experiment, look at, how, look at the world and it just fits all the data Here's why quantum mechanics works. Here's why relativity works. You know, here's why pair labs gets what they get. You know, all of these things. Why can people, you know, uh, interact with past lives? You know, how is that possible? Well, it's data. It's just information. You're in a consciousness system. This is an information system. It's got memory. Memory's history, right? Of course, it's all there. But that doesn't mean that, that it's there the way a lot of people imagine it to be there. We've got a lot of dogma that's grown up about how yeah. this thing works as well. So you kind of have to peel that apart. But once you understand it from a big picture view, what's dogma and what's real becomes totally obvious. It's not a, well, who could tell? Who knows? <laughs> who knows what happens after we die? Nobody could know because nobody can die and come back and so on. But that's not the case. With consciousness, you can follow the death procedure. You can go to that virtual reality where people have to transition into that form. You can, ex you can work there, you can, ex you, know, you can have experiences there. It's just another virtual reality. It's just a different data stream. It's not a hard thing to do. The only thing that makes it hard is that we believe it's hard. That's what makes it hard. <laughs> if we, you know, it's not that we have to learn anything new, we just have to unlearn all the beliefs that make it hard. Yeah. So it's, you know, it seems, so obvious and so easy, <laughs> you know, in one way, and then it seems so impossible and so complicated, you know, from a different perspective. But we just need to find that overarching understanding that makes it all simple. And when you find that, then that's one of the definitions of fundamental truth, is that it explains everything simply. It's not real complicated. If you explain it with this huge mass of complication, it's probably not fundamental truth. It's probably too many assumptions that are propping up, you know, this 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 thing. So that's, you know, it's like, well, why would I? Why would somebody want to accept all this kind of wild ravings of two mad scientists? You know, <laughs> why would he want to accept it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, it works. Look at the data. You know, look at the evidence, and it's there. And I don't mean evidence that's open to interpretation. I mean hard scientific yeah. evidence. Look at it. It's there. It's showing you this. Then look at the bigger picture. You know, look at a little bigger picture, and you can see the same thing. It works there, too. It explains lots of things. You know, it's, you know have people ever had a precognitive dream? Sure. There's thousands of, of, of instances of that sort of thing. All these people are just crazy liars? Of course not, you know? And it explains, how does that work? Well, that's not hard to explain. They're just consciousness. They're collecting data out of a future probable database. It's there for anybody to look at, look at, you know, just like the historical databases. So all this weird stuff is easily explainable. And all of the stuff we already know, all the experiments we've done, all the evidence we collected falls right into place. Exactly. It's all just 
So now what's left? Well, what's left is to share the news with everybody else, <laughs> that, right? That was That's it. What's left on is, that. To, is, to, is to help other people get it because, as you say, we are driving ourselves, you know, eventually you'll go past a, a point where it's easy to get back. And we are driving ourselves with our fear-based reasoning, with our it's only physical, you know, the, you know, we're the masters of the universe, so it doesn't care what we do with it, not realizing that we're actually a part of the universe, and we and it kind of all exist together. You know, we're starting to get that with the ecological sense of, you know, there's biomes, and we have to be a responsible citizen, you know, within our environment. That, that's creeping in over, what, the last 50 years. It's kind of grown to a point where now a lot of people get that, but they have to take a bigger step than that. It's not just that we are you know, we're one of, one piece of the environment in this physical plane. Yes, that's our, that's our learning lab where we come to experience, to mm -hmm. grow up. But then it goes up beyond that, you know. We're yeah. one, we're one, uh, we're one planet maybe, in a group. You a know? We're, we're one universe in a whole set of virtual realities that are all non-physical to us, but are physical to the people in them. Physical and non-physical turns out to be just a perspective of the individual, whatever you're in, whatever your you know, perception is, whatever the data stream you have, that's physical. And if it's not in your data stream, that's not physical. So there's really no difference between physical and non-physical. One's not more primary than the other. They're just different, uh, you know, it's relative to the perspective of the observer. Bruce, would you, would you like to sum up where, what you've experienced here with Tom today? You know, um, First of all, I, I, I feel really good because I know that I go out on a limb a lot when I start talking physics and people in the audience go, yeah, you're a cell biology guy. What the hell do you know about physics? It's really <laughs> like, thank you, whatever path I took, it was like corroborated by <laughs> what Tom is talking about. And, and, uh, and it's a full, total agreement uh, with the concept of information and mind being the physical expression of information as the membrane, and both of us are talking about what? Expanding that to this higher and higher level, which is really fun because, um, so you say, okay, so Bruce, you, you get to the point where all the humans come together, and uh, they create a new organism called humanity. Is that the end of it? And I go, no, and Tom brought this up. It's like, the, when we complete that, Gaia, the living organism with us, completes its evolution as a cell. And then when you go back to the fractal character of it, the first thing you recognize is when the new organism is formed, its next level is to make communities with other wow. so formed organisms. So we are at a level of ready to communicate, but we aren't born. We're not humanity yet. We're still a bunch of, you know, seven billion cells trying to coordinate this one thing. And so we can't have a dialogue with the other sources that are out there because we aren't a unity that would uh, be involved with that dialogue. So that's coming into the front. Uh, uh, secondarily, uh, the concept of putting it into fractals and in nature, all that, and Tom just touched on it, and that's why I want to bring it back up, is, look, we're struggling with seven billion people trying to, how the hell are we gonna survive on this big planet with just seven billion, you know, seven billion people? I go, underneath your skin, you have 50 trillion citizens. Every cell is a sentient being. They live in a community. They live in harmony. They live in great adaptability. Humans, as beings, can live anywhere and because we can adapt to everything. So what does it represent? Well, you say the human did that. And I go, yeah, but you're still not perceiving. It's the 50 trillion sentient amoebas that constitute a human that did that. And I say, we look at around and, and we say, how can we create the harmony and peace we're looking for? I say, well, look in, as the mystic said, the answers lie within. Go in under that skin and then say, every cell is an entity. Every cell has a job. Every cell gets paid. Every cell gets health care. Every cell gets protection. Uh, there, there's a social structure. There's a, a, a government, the nervous system, which is conducting, coordinating, but communicating with the 50 trillion citizens. It's not a, a one-way thing. The cells can certainly talk back, and if you've got symptoms of something, you, you, you've got some cells in your body complaining about something. Uh, and, and so I say, well, isn't that great? The answers that we need to live on this planet are already here. 
We just have to look inside and say, how do they do that? They have an economy, they get paid, and, and right away that offers like, oh my God, if you see how the economy in a human body works, and compare it to the destructive economy that we have created in human civilization, you realize <laughs> the human version of economy is, is destructive. The, the version of the economy inside the system is completely supportive of, of life. And, and if we modeled our economy after that, we would be taking the biggest jump that both Tom and I are talking about of putting this all together as a unity at this point, okay? So the interesting aspect about this is, if I, just, if I could just give two minutes on that, it's really simple. Here we are with people, you know, uh, a massive portion of this entire population fending from day to day with not enough to stay alive. And then we have individuals that, you know, like $50 billion, $60 billion, all these things. I go, well, th does that work in the system where cells are getting paid and there's an economy? I go, no. And here's how it works in the system. This is why if we understood it and modeled off of this body, we would succeed. And basically the system is simply saying this, that, number one, wealth means um, money, economics, resources, energy beyond what is necessary for survivability. Once you have survivability, anything beyond that is called wealth. Well, here's the point. There is no wealth in the human body until every cell is given the very basics of life. Every cell has food, every cell has a place to, to be and work and job, every cell uh, has got health care, protection and all this. Every cell's got that. There's no cell with wealth until every cell is given the basics of life. Once the cells are given the basics of life and there's extra produce, that constitutes wealth. But guess what? Every cell then can accumulate wealth. In, in the f physical form of ATP molecules, which biologists actually call the coin of the realm, uh, which are energy units, uh, so cells can accumulate wealth, but then guess what? Then there reaches a physical limit of how much wealth they can hold on to because they only are so physical big and can only hold so much. Uh, the next level is this. Anything beyond that that covers the individual as much wealth as they could carry, wealth beyond that goes into the community bank which is energy used by the entire community for whatever it needs for its evolution, growth, maintenance, and development. So that if I break my leg, my liver cell doesn't go, oh, you're going to take my salary to fix that leg? <laughs> you know, it's basically, no, it basically says that we share, and Tom brought this up, it's the nature of, uh, I'm, we're not out for ourselves. The cells are not out for themselves. When that happens, that's cancer. That's where a cell says, look, I don't need to participate with your system. I just, I'm going to feed off of you, and I'm going to take everything. I'm not putting anything back. That, that would be a cancer. In our particular situation, as Tom brought up, is like, no, the cells are in it for the community. And the community uh, doesn't say it's communism. Oh, okay, all cells get paid exactly the same. Absolutely not. Neurons get, get so much money, they have an entourage of other cells to support them. <laughs> Skin cells, they, they don't make anywhere near that much money, but guess what? <laughs> they all have a life. They all have an environment. They all share consciousness and awareness. <clears throat> This is why they came together. Why? If one cell has awareness and I have 50 trillion cells, then I have 50 trillion cells uh, each sharing their awareness in the collective system. And with that sharing of awareness, every cell is informed of what's going on and every cell has access to all the data. So basically, uh, this is the model of what I think our human civilization is trying to come to and recognize this. We are cells. We work in harmony. We differentiate. We all have jobs. but. To make that evolutionary leap, we can't say, well, you know, screw the cells in Africa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Who needs them? I got a lot of money. I don't care about them. It's like that's the failure of the system, the failure where uh, the entropy is, you know, is just exploding as chaos all over the place. It's not sustainable. It will die. And then so it's basically coming to the necessity of creating a community based on sharing information, based on bringing harmony. Uh, based on um, uh, on the awareness of all of us are part of the same thing, and if you uh, hurt one other person, that w you know that would be for me to say, well, you know, listen, Chuck, I, I want you to go in your body, and I want you to take a bunch of cells out and, and kill them. I want you to take an organ out and kill it. And you go, take an organ out and kill it? What are you crazy? <laughs> you know, and it's sort of like, well, we do that all the time. We just could destroy a nation and destroy this. Like, oh, that's okay, just to get rid of them. It's like, well. 
they miss the boat, they miss the awareness, they miss the consciousness. That's what Tom is really bringing up in the whole thing is you can't operate without that consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and since consciousness is a driving force, then the evolution that we're facing is the evolution of the consciousness, not the evolution of the biological body. We already right. did that part. Right. Well, it's still going on. That, that simulation is still evolving, so it's not that the physical evolution is, is a done deal. We can still evolve and we can maybe get an extra finger or a bigger head for a bigger brain. That's not necessarily done, but it's more or less irrelevant. Absolutely. You know, it's not, that's not the important, where we need evolution is with consciousness. The quality Absolutely. of consciousness is what needs to evolve. We have all the, we have all the physical stuff in this virtual reality that we need to succeed in the game. You know, that's the thing. We, we've, we've gotten that far and we've been there for some millions of years. But yeah. now it's taking the next step, which we evolve the quality of our consciousness. Yeah. It's, not, it's not about growing a bigger head with a bigger brain. That bigger brain has already created a lot of trouble <laughs> for us. Why would you think that that's the solution? <laughs> and, 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 and here's a message from the bigger brain. <laughs> we, we have run out of time. <laughs> oh. And, the, and the, uh, the referee is calling it, <laughs> oh, you're almost going to be a penalty if, oh. if we don't move on this. But this has been absolute magic. To see the two of you together and to see your brains just go like this is an incredible experience. And our viewer is going to see that and experience that. What has happened here today is a moment in history. Because the people that are talking about getting the word out are getting the word out with each other.